those of you who were not here at the beginning of the series, I just want to recap what we're doing together. We're going through a series that looks at words that kind of get commonly thrown around in Christian circles uh, that maybe just need a little more clarification as to exactly what they mean. Uh, so we say a lot of words like faith and love and grace and these types of things. Uh, and whenever we say any word, there's a mental image that comes or just a description that comes in our head as to what that word means and it's not all the same. We often have different ideas as to what words mean and how to define them. So we're going to look at some of these common words uh, and try to give a, a good definition for them to help us to really understand what the Christian faith is all about. So tonight what we're looking at is a word that comes up a lot in the Gospels. It comes up really like a huge amount of time. So to introduce the topic, I want to kind of do a little game with you, I suppose. I want you to think of something that you've never seen before, okay? Which I know is impossible. So if someone was to say that, like I try to describe to you something that you've never seen before, they're going to use metaphors, they're going to use similes to try and describe it, things that exist that you do know about already uh, that can help you to get a grasp of what it is. So. I want you to think of something you've never seen before. And here are the metaphors I'm going to be using to describe it. Okay, so this thing, it's kind of like weed, weed, weeds growing up among wheat. It's also kind of like a mustard seed growing or yeast spreading through dough. It's also kind of like finding hidden treasure. It's also kind of like a net that's full of fish. It's also kind of like a household that has both new valuable things and old valuable things in it. It's also kind of like a king who decides to forgive all the debts that are owed to him. It's also kind of like a, work, a bunch of workers who are paid uh, for a day's labor, but they don't all do the same amount of work. It's also kind of like a bunch of violent tenants who get kicked out of the place they're living uh, and replaced with new tenants. It's also kind of like wedding guests who don't show up at the party and so other people come in their place. It's also kind of like a seed which is part of the ground and grows by its own kind of uh, steam. It's also kind of like uh, servants who are waiting for their master's return. Do you have an idea? Like, that's pretty clear, right? Like, you, you kind of, you know, you've got enough to go on. Like, obviously not. Like, it would be impossible for you to have really a clear idea as to what exactly I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about if you know your Bible because you know what the parables I'm referring to. But Jesus Christ uses all of these compar uh, comparisons to talk about the kingdom of God. He says the kingdom of God is like this and that and this and that and this and that. And that's, I think all of them, at least as, as far as my memory uh, serves me, uh, the, all of the ones that Jesus Christ uses in the Gospels to talk about uh, what the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like. Fun fact for you, the reason why Matthew says kingdom of heaven and the other Gospels say Kingdom of God is because Matthew's written to a Jewish audience and Jewish people were uncomfortable with attaching the name of God to something. And so I guess for the sake of like politeness, uh, Matthew doesn't attach the name God but instead Heaven. But it's exactly the same thing. Kingdom of God, Kingdom of Heaven, same thing that Jesus Christ is speaking of here. Jesus spoke about the Kingdom of God a lot. He spoke about it Really, it was one of the main topics of teaching that he went over. And so to him, it seems really important that we understand what it is, uh, what it's going to look like as well. This was something that he drove home a lot. And as I said, whenever the Bible repeats itself on something, it's really God trying to get our attention. And if that's true, then the repetition alone should be this glaring big sign to us. Like, this is important. So what is it? What is the kingdom of God? When we speak about it, what are we talking about? There's an obvious answer, and then there's a non-obvious answer. All right? So the obvious answer, when we're trying to talk about this, is the kingdom of God is God setting up His reign over the world, over all human institutions, over all of our lives. God is setting up His reign. He is establishing Himself as King of our lives, of this world, establishing a perfect and holy uh, society, institutions of justice, of peace, of community, of unity, are going to be uh, 
established by God and ruled by Him. That's what the kingdom of God is. And when Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God, that is what He's speaking about. He's speaking of God establishing His rule in this world in a perfect way. But that's the obvious answer. And that shouldn't be difficult for us to understand. But then there's a non-obvious answer too. Because Jesus Christ goes to a great length of trying to describe the character of this kingdom, the nature of what this is going to look like. And the real overarching question is, when you think about what is God doing in this world? Like, what's He up to in this world? One of the ways you can answer that kingdom is, sorry, that question is, He is establishing His kingdom. But that needs clarification. And so Jesus is perfectly aware of the non-obviousness of it. And he says in Luke chapter 17, uh, verse 20 and 21, he says this, Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. So Jesus is saying, I know you're expecting this very, very obvious, very uh, evident type of thing that's going to happen where God is going to come and boom, like all the world is going to know all at once. But Jesus is saying, actually, there's going to be a bit of a mystery here. There's going to be a non-obvious quality to this kingdom. What, what one would expect God to do when it comes to God breaking into the human situation, uh, one would expect that to be kind of an unmissable event. But Jesus is saying, no, it, it's not going to be like what you expect. And it said, we see Jesus speaking, one of the things he says is Matthew chapter 13, uh, verse uh, 31, I think. Yeah, 31. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the, tree, all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. And remember what he's talking about here. He's talking about the kingdom of God, God establishing his rule and reign in this world. And he's saying it's going to be like a mustard seed. This thing that in the beginning is really tiny and small, and yet given time will grow into something massive and incredibly, influ <coughs> incredibly influential. And this parable gives us clues as to the non-obvious side of the kingdom of God. That the nature of it, it's going to unfold in a very interesting, mysterious way. See, the Jewish people had an expectation of what the kingdom of God was. They thought that God was going to come, and when He came, boom, things changed. The world would be radically transformed. And Jesus is saying, that's going to happen, but there's something that's going to happen before that. And the before that is what you really need to pay attention to if you're going to, be, if you're going to catch, or if you're going to be on the right side of things when the next thing comes. See, <clears throat> Jesus is talking about really what people understood as being one event as essentially being two events. He speaks about the kingdom being both present and yet not yet present. He says in Matthew chapter 4, 17, uh, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then just a bit later in Matthew 6, 10, he teaches us to pray, thy kingdom come. Pray to God that his kingdom would come into this world. And so this is what theologians will point out to as being called the already but not yet of the kingdom. That there is a sense in which the kingdom is already here and there is a sense in which it is not yet here. And so when you ask the question, look, uh, is, the, is the kingdom of God something that's present now or is it something that's going to be present in the future, it's coming in the future? The answer to the question is yes. Yes to both. It is present now. It is going to come in the future too. It is already but it is not yet. The first stage of coming comes with Christ, and this is the mustard seed approach. The
The second is when it is in glory and power, when final judgment comes and the new heaven and earth appear as well. The Jewish expectation was for that second coming alone, that God would come and establish His reign in a powerful, dramatic way. But their expectation is when that happened, they would find themselves on top. That it would be Israel that is established as the redeemed nation, as the ruling nation of all the world. And the problem with that is because of the nature of sin, because of, of God's holiness, if that was to be the case, if God was just going to come at that one moment without there being atonement for sin, then there would be no one who was going to be part of that ruling, redeemed people. Because there was no way for redemption to happen outside of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. And so the expectation of the Jewish people had to be kind of undone and remade because if that was to be the way that God established His kingdom, they wouldn't have made it. They wouldn't have been in the position they thought they were going to be. And so the first coming, the first inauguration of the kingdom comes through the atonement. The atonement that Jesus Christ brings. God knew that that had to be the way. First to redeem and deliver a people and then to renew His people and the universe completely. That all would come under the rulership of God at the second point. What this means for us is that we today, in the here and now, can begin to experience aspects of the Kingdom of God. Yes, that will one day, only one day be fully realized, but it's still a pretty amazing idea that today, in the here and now, we can experience aspects of God's reign already in this world. Kind of like a taste of heaven right here now. That God's power has broken into this world and the future promises can be tasted right now. And if you're kind of more mathematical in mind, think of it almost like a Venn diagram, okay? So you've got two circles and the two circles overlap at one point. And so in the one circle you have kind of the, the realm of like sin and death and the brokenness of this world. And in the other circle it's the new heaven and earth, it's, it's perfection, it's holiness, it's, it's what is to come. And where it overlaps is where we live. We live in this stage now where we still experience the, the brokenness of this world and the effects of sin and death, but we also experience an inbreaking of the kingdom where both are no longer, well, where the brokenness that it's no longer what it was and the newness isn't what it's going to be, but there's a mixture of it at this point now where death has, the power of death has been broken, but death is still the final enemy. Where sin has been conquered, but yet there is still an, a, a, a a side of us, the, the fleshly side of us, that pulls us away from God. And so there is still a battle that takes place. But that's where we live, in that place now. And so the Kingdom of God is present and available for us today. And I listed a few ways that it is present and available to us. Firstly, through miracles and through the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has anointed us in the same way, and it's at least a similar way, the same way, that it anointed Jesus. And that we have um, the, the guidance, we have the, the filling, uh, the intimacy, we also have uh, through prayer and through the, the power of the Holy Spirit and the authority of Jesus Christ, uh, we can see miracles in this world, we can see resurrection, we can see uh, the authority of Jesus Christ coming into this world and moving things out of the way. We can see that and that's an inbreaking of the kingdom. We also can see that there is a, a new power and authority over uh, the evil in this world, the demonic forces and the devil, that we can walk in this new place where the, the demons no longer have the, the same power to manipulate us and to, to have access to our lives and to, to guide our steps, but we can, we can walk free of this influence and we can actually command it to, to go in the name of Jesus Christ too because He is King over that. We can see also this in conversion. This is another way that we see the Kingdom of God coming in. That the power of God is coming into people's lives and radically transforming them. That we who were once dead are now being made alive by the power of God. That's an in-breaking of the Kingdom into this world. We, apart from the work of God, have no hope for salvation. No hope to be converted except for the work of God in our life. But we can see it. Every time someone be, be, repents and believes and comes into the family of God, it is a si sign that the kingdom of God is among us. We can see it too in forgiveness. But bear in mind, the inauguration of this kingdom came through the atonement. Now, because of the atonement, we can be forgiven of our sins completely and fully. 
Whereas beforehand that was not an option, now it is. It's something that we can experience. This major obstacle to our relationship with God has been removed and overcome. The king has forgiven his debts and now we can be brought in. Also righteousness. Now we have a new way of living. Uh, something has opened up for us that we can begin to walk in a newness of life. We can begin to follow after what God is desiring for us in this world. And so because of this, new appetites of the heart are birthed. Uh, new directions for life are forged before us. We can see this happening. We also have a new joy. The, the joy of knowing that we have a hope for the future. This is a fruit of the kingdom that's in, in breaking. And also, and lastly, purpose. Now we see a new reason to live, a new, not only a new way of living, but a new reason to live. It's, it's incredible that we can wake up each day and know that our lives are pointing in a direction, that they count for something, that they're going to, to one day, we're gonna reap a reward for what we've done, and we have a, a, an opportunity to walk in that today. It's an amazing, beautiful truth. And so all of those, six or seven, eight, however many uh, of these fruit are the fruit of what God has done, is doing, and will finish as He brings His rule and reign into the world. We can access this. Wolfhard uh, Pannenberg, he's an interesting theologian, he says this, uh, Only in the faith of individuals who, responding to the summons of Jesus, subordinate all other concerns in this life to the imminency of the divine rule, does this future already become the present? So we think about the future and the kingdom that God is trying to establish. We, by submitting our lives in faith to Him, begin to experience this in the present. It's a beautiful and wonderful truth, and we are the only ones who get to experience that. Uh, this is our response. It is to seek His kingdom first. What is, what is, the, what is the command of Jesus? To, to seek uh, first the kingdom and its righteousness, and then all things will be added unto you. Our response to, the, to the, the news that the kingdom is here is to seek it, to go after God's rule being established, His reign being established in our life. But there's even more to it than that. Not only are we to live in light of, Jesus, of, of God's reign in this world and be subjects of His kingdom, but we also become an agent of His work in establishing the kingdom in this world. That the way that it seems to function is he establishes his love and authority in individuals and then they bring it further into the world that through God establishing his love and authority in my life my life can then be used to bring it out further into this world and through that the kingdom of God grows I have a long quote here by Timothy Keller uh, it's, it's really good what is the relationship of the church to the kingdom on one hand the church is a pilot plant of the kingdom of God. It is not simply a collection of individuals who are forgiven. It is a royal nation, 1 Peter 2, chapter 9. In other words, a counterculture. The church is to be a new society in which the world can be uh, in which the world can see what family dynamics, business practices, race relations, and all of life can be under the kingship of Jesus Christ. God is out to heal all the effects of sin psychological, social, and physical. On the other hand, the church is to be an agent of the kingdom. It is not only to model the healing uh, of God's rule, but to spread it. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Christians go into the world as witnesses of the kingdom. To spread the kingdom of God is more than simply winning people to Christ. It is also working for the healing of persons, families, relationships, and nations. It is doing deeds of mercy and seeking justice. It is ordering lives and relationships and institutions and communities according to God's authority to bring in the blessedness of the kingdom. That's a long quote, and I know, I know it's probably uh, like trying to drink from a fire, fire hose. There's a lot going on there. Uh, I can maybe say that in a few smaller words, this is what uh, Pannenberg says. The church has been given a noble task. It serves both as sign pointing to a future society of peace and justice that no political system can bring into existence. 
and as a reminder of the transience of all societal orders in contrast to the finality of God's rule. We serve as a sign of what is to come. That's when we do at our best. The church can be a sign of what it looks like to live in God's kingdom. And there's a brokenness that we carry, and so it's important to realize what we're talking about here. We're not saying that the church is going to be what's going to fix this world. This world is broken. It will continue to be broken. Uh, we are not going to be the thing that's finally going to fix the world. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't try through acts of compassion uh, and reaching out in mercy and seeking justice in this world to, to, to alleviate pain, uh, to try to heal some of the effects of sin. We absolutely do that. We have to do that. But we are simply a sign of what God is ultimately going to do in the future. And so we point towards that through our acts and through our words now. This, uh, this brokenness will continue until the kingdom of God fully comes. And so, <coughs> if this is who we're supposed to be, let's try to like bring it down into our lives today uh, and to think about the nuts and bolts of what that means. Uh, and I want to get to that in just a moment, but before we get that, uh, there's a question that I always kind of had in the back of my mind, and I think maybe some of you guys have too, is there's a weird kind of disconnect in the Bible when it comes to the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is, is referred to a lot by Jesus, and then basically never in the rest of the New Testament. It, it, it kind of just vanishes off the scene as soon as uh, the Gospels uh, are done with. So the kingdom, the word kingdom at least, is mentioned 126 times in the Gospel and yet only 30, uh, 34 times in the rest of the New Testament. But even when those, in those 34 times in the New Testament, it is not really referring to kingdom in, in, the same, well, in the same sense, or at least in the same kind of way of speaking that Jesus Christ is speaking about it too. So what's going on here? Why is it such a big deal for Jesus and then really doesn't really come up again uh, after the, the Gospels are over? So uh, John Piper addresses this question in a sermon, and I'm going to try to kind of paraphrase his answer as well. So it seems like when Jesus Christ is uh, doing his ministry in the world, he's kind of walking on this tightrope between announcing that the kingdom of God has arrived uh, and describing what it's going to look like, uh, yet at the same time trying his best to not be misunderstood uh, to be the king that they were expecting because they were expecting a certain kind of king and Jesus knows I'm not that guy like I'm not the king that you're expecting and so he has to speak in such a way that the kingdom is what's in focus primarily and that's what people's attention on that's what the teachings about to try to get them to, to refocus their vision because it's only after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that you are truly able to understand what kind of king he is and so there seems to be this sort of like, he is shining the spotlight upon the kingdom because he knows people are not really going to be able to understand who he is until his death and resurrection because that and the atonement is really what kicks off the kingdom of God. And so once that occurs, once his death and resurrection occurs, now we can see with clarity who Jesus Christ is. And we can put the two and two together because now he's set us up to know what this kingdom is going to look like. But now we shift our attention to who this king is. And this king is really who we focus on. Because it's through him that we get to understand what the kingdom is like as well. But he it becomes our, our jumping off point. And so that's where the focus becomes. So Piper says that the declaration that Jesus Christ is Lord is almost synonymous with the declaration that the kingdom has come. So when, when the New Testament is saying Jesus is Lord, they're really reiterating what Jesus Christ was saying is the kingdom of God is, is here. It's at hand. They're basically saying the same thing. They're just saying it in different ways. Where one is putting the, Jesus is putting the kingdom in focus and he has reasons to do that. And the New Testament is putting, well the New Testament writers, the apostles, uh, are putting Jesus Christ as the Lord in the focus. And they have very good reason to do that as well. And we start thinking about it this way as they're just talking about the same thing but using different words to describe it. We actually see the kingdom of God appear in a lot of places all over the New Testament. Uh, it might be a fun exercise. I don't know. I thought about this today while I was writing the sermon. Maybe it's biting before you can, then you can chew. But it might be a fun exercise in your small groups 
to look at a particular parable that speaks of the, the kingdom of God, you know, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, it's like a, you know, a net full of fish, blah, blah, blah. Um, and to see where in the New Testament, outside of the Gospels, the same idea is being spoken of by the New Testament writers. Because they go through the idea. Again, if we just jump back to the beginning and say, what is the kingdom of God? It's really like the question, what is God doing in this world? He's establishing His reign. And so, does the New Testament address the idea of what is God doing in this world and what is He going to do? Do, do the apostles address that? Absolutely they do. They do it all the time. And so, I think it's really an interesting exercise to try to point to the two places where the same idea will come up. Do you get the point? Jess is nodding. Thanks, Jess. At least Jess's group is going to do well. <laughs> okay. So, lastly, let's address the idea as why it's important. You know, we're talking about knowing what the kingdom of God is. Jesus Christ speaks about it a lot. Why is this important? Well, we can see the, we can see the effect of not understanding. It's all over the Gospels. There is a huge amount of confusion around the kingdom of God. And you can see it on a lot of pages of the Gospels. Uh, there is a mystery to this. There's a mystery to what God is doing in this world in establishing His reign. It's not obvious. There's a subtlety to it. There's a, there's a mystery behind it as well. And so we see that same struggle being seen all over the place in the Gospels. When Jesus Christ is trying to teach about the kingdom and trying to help people understand, uh, we see the Pharisees get confused. John the Baptist is called of God by it. The crowd at one point tries to throw him off a cliff. The, another crowd at another point tries to make him king by force. Uh, Pilate is baffled by it. The, the, the disciples are left completely bewildered and hopeless after the death of Jesus Christ. None of them got it. None of them could really get what Jesus Christ was speaking about and, and what God was doing in this world. And so, can we misunderstand it? Absolutely. And when we do, the effects can be catastrophic. So we have to make sure we get it right. We understand what is the kingdom of God. And when we do, I think two things take place. The first thing that takes place is that if you understand what the kingdom of God is, you're able to sleep well at night. Okay? You can sleep really well at night. Okay? And here's why. Because it does two things. The first thing is it gives you a sense of certainty. You know what the future holds. You know it because it's already begun. That Jesus Christ has come. That the Holy Spirit has come and put a seal upon your heart, a guarantee of your inheritance. God has begun a work in this world already that is, is still working. And so that can give you a sense of rock-solid certainty about the future. To know, okay, there is a future that is that's set in stone that I'm aiming towards. And at the same time, it gives you a sense of patience because there is an incompleteness to this world that we can be okay with when we understand it. you know there are certain questions that will hang over our heads certain doubts certain struggles but when we look at what the kingdom of God is we know that there's a not yetness to it that God is not finished that that's going to be the way things are he said it's going to be like this we we were told we were warned beforehand so you're not going to have all the answers, and that's okay. Certain brokennesses about this world will continue, and that's okay. We can live with this because we're prepared for it. And so we have both. We have a certainty, and yet we have a familiar... A familiar yeah. Yeah. yeah, you said it. <laughs> that we can be, that, that, that can travel with us, that means we can, we can rest without questions and without certainty. We can rest. The second thing that can happen, what should happen, is that God's reign, king, the kingdom of God in breaking into your life, should leave a deep mark on you. It should be a really deep mark upon your life. To come under the reign of God, the rule of Jesus Christ, there shouldn't be an area of your life that is not affected by it. And so if you haven't asked yourself the question, how is my job affected by the kingdom of God? 
How is my family? How is my personal time? How is my finances? How are my relationships affected by coming under the kingdom of God and the, the inbreaking of the kingdom of God in this world? If you're not asking those questions, then you're still living as part of another kingdom. You're still part of one of these kingdoms that society pops up all over the place that fades as quick as they come. Uh, that's based upon a bunch of human rules and desires and values that are, are here today and gone tomorrow. You're living by society's rules. You're, you're, you're assuming what society assumes and, and, and you're living out of that worldview. And you need to wake up to that and come under the reign of God in a true, true sense. So as we go out into this world, let's go out conscious of the fact that we are subjects of God's kingdom. And let our, let our lives truly reflect that idea. And let's sleep well tonight. Okay? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for your kingdom. We thank you that you have established your rule in our hearts. And you continue to establish your rule in the world around us. We thank you that we are not left orphans in this world. That we are not left without a hope. But you have already brought so much to us and you continue to work it out in our lives. So we pray, Lord, you help us to see what you're doing in this world and to come under it and become part of it. We pray you help our lives, all of us individually and together as a community, to be a sign of what you are doing in this world. We pray, Lord, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Alright, so now it's